the fact that I grow all my vegetables, I grow all my herbs, I grow all, any plant I want without using any chemicals at all. And that is, in the world we live in today, that is particularly important for us to do. Um, and <clears throat> the idea, and I'm not gonna speak long on this, because <laughs> I could speak a long time on this. Um, it, the, the idea is it's not that you use chemicals, it's just that you multiply you times millions and millions of people um, on the planet, billions of people on the planet. So those are the things we need to keep in mind. And the herbs are how I kept my garden healthy. Um, you have some handouts that um, I um, had them, they nicely uh, made copies for you all. And we're gonna um, go through some of the handouts that I handed up, that, that you have. Um, and also the slides um, here. And these are all slides from Herbs in My Garden that I have taken. So um, most of them are really nice, but some of them are not as beautiful as they could be. So just, just uh, excuse the, uh, the uh, uh, pictures. So, anyone know what this is? Fake leaf. It's almost like a fake leaf. It's, um, it's blood root. Blood root? Blood root is a native understory of our woodland plants in Indiana and other places that, uh, that and what I love is this is why we grow plants. When we look at the plants, we have a relationship with the plant. And this to me is like, this is my most beautiful picture that I've ever taken with the sunlight coming through this. And they are up now. They're about this tall. They are a spring ephemeral. The bloom can sometimes last only one day. So you have to be always on the lookout to see when they're blooming. It's been wetter and cooler, so the blossoms have stayed. This is now the third day, which is amazing <laughs> to have blossoms on the blood root. But it's an important um, native um, medicinal plant. Um, a lot of our woodlands, where I grow, I live on 27 and a half acres in Putnam County, and where I live, they had cows um, in the woods and on the um, pastures. And so the cows destroyed all the understory. And what we all know is that there is an overstory, a midstory, and an understory, and they're all equally important <coughs> in a woodland. And it has just been in the last five years, and we moved there in 1987, in the last five years, the understory has started to come back. It's taken it that long to where I'm seeing the native plants return to this piece of land. So it's, it's wonderful that it happens, and it can happen. Um, so anyway, I just think that's the most beautiful picture. So we're gonna talk, um, each slide is gonna be a plant that you can grow. Um, growing herbs um, is not difficult. Um, many of them are perennial. Most of the herbs that we use in our kitchen are not native plants. So, and there isn't one native culinary herb in America that we consider a culinary herb. It's not that there aren't native plants we use in our food, it's just as a culinary herb there is not one native. They're all, most of the ones are Mediterranean plants. Um, but we can grow them easily here. They are not invasive, so they can grow nicely in our gardens. Um, most of them need full sun. So to have a good medicinal, excuse me, medicinal, sorry, I talk a lot about medicinal herbs. <laughs> to have a good herb garden, whether um, you need a lot of sun, okay? Because most of these plants like full sun and they like well-drained soil. And so it depends on your garden soil um, whether how heavy clay it is on my piece of land. Um, it was clay loam and clay, um, and there were a couple areas that had a little bit more sand in it. Um, but the clay loam is beautiful for growing plants. Um, the heavier clay had to be worked at to make it so, so that it would grow, so that it would happily and <coughs> grow plants really well. So anyone grow Angelica? Yeah, no? Okay, Angelica Archangelica. I forget I have it here. <laughs> I have it right here. <laughs> so um, as you can see, the most important thing in growing a garden, whether it's a vegetable garden, a perennial garden, an herb garden, or a combination of all of them, is w which is what I do, um, is diversity. Diversity is the most important thing. Without diversity, life dies out. Okay, we just, we don't have a healthy environment and a lot of life dies out. So soil, everyone, are, who, who's a gardener in the room? 
already. So you're all gardeners. So soil is your most important thing that you do, right? Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> because if you don't have healthy soil, you're not going to have healthy plants, okay? So you have soil, um, you have soil diversity, and then your attention, whatever attention um, you are giving to your garden. And um, gardening is a lot of work, right? <laughs> and depending on how big or how little your garden is, depends on how much work it is. But it's really important that you pay attention. Um, Angelica, if you, you can see in this photo, the blossom is just coming up. It's gonna be about three, three and a half feet tall when it's in bloom. So it's a really big plant. plant. It's an APACA family plant, which used to be called <coughs> Umbellifera, if you're familiar with the um, families of plants, and umbellifera is um, like dill or fennel, okay? Looks like an upside down umbrella. So every 15, 20 years, maybe even 10 years, 10, 15 years, botanists around the world get together and decide what, you know, new plants, what family they're going to go in, and about 15 years ago, 20 years ago maybe, it's, you know, it's hard to keep track of time sometimes, um, it, um, they got together, and change the families and and so when whatever family of plant you have because this goes to diversity so we all have let's say you have sage and you have thyme and you have lavender and you have basil okay um, they're all in the same family so when plants are in the same family the importance of knowing um, a family of plants is that plants in the same family um, get the same diseases and they usually have the same pests so you can, it can look diverse with all the plants I just mentioned. It can look diverse, but it is not diverse because they're all in the same family. And being in the same family means they have a similar flower structure. The flower structure, that's how they're put into families. And what makes, what makes anything in a plant or what makes anything in our bodies? What we call chemicals, okay? Uh, these are obviously natural chemicals, but the chemicals in a plant determine the shape of its flower. And so the chemicals in the plant also determine what insects like that plant or don't like that plant, and, and also what diseases the plant is more prone to or not prone to. So it's, um, it's important to, if you can, or if you choose to, I love knowing all the different plant families. It's, it's an information that I enjoy having. Um, but so this plant gives you diversity and the umbellifera or APACA family of plants, the beneficial insects, the, especially the flies and beneficial flies and wasps, love the APACA family plants. So your dill, your fennel, your angelica, they love all these different plants. Um, and because they're tiny. So most of the beneficial insects in your garden you won't notice unless you're looking. Um, actually the county educator of Montgomery County Jim, I can't, why can't I? Luzar. Luzar, I was just gonna say Luzar. Um, um, I love Jim Luzar, so he came to my Earth Festival one year, and he walked around the garden, and he came up and he said, I counted 267 beneficial insects in your garden. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, I don't know 267 <laughs> beneficial insects. I knew I had a lot, but I don't know them. I don't know all the beneficials. And I don't need to know when I have a diverse garden and I have good soil and I don't have the chemicals which are killing the beneficial insects, then, then I'm going to have a healthy garden. So this is alfalfa, which we see in fields around, right? Has anyone seen alfalfa? Yeah. This is the most beautiful plant. I love it when it's in bloom. And the bees love it when it's in bloom. So it's a great bee plant, breaks up the subsoils, brings subsoil nutrients to the topsoils and nitrogen fixing and mineral rich. So this can be a green manure. Anyone grow green manures? Do you know what a green manure is? No. <laughs> so a green manure um, or and cover crops, so they can be kind of interchangeable. So cover crops, okay, some of you grow cover crops. They cover crops and um, um, they are grown to hold the soil, to enrich the soil, and then to work into the soil to improve the soil, and alfalfa can be one of those. You can also, in your garden, um, when you're growing um, herbs, is that um, you can grow, like you could grow some alfalfa, and, because um, you can drink it as a tea, <laughs> for yourself besides the peas. 
Um, you can grow, depending on how big your garden is, you can grow some herbs like alfalfa to improve the soil like in a row. You do interplanting. So you grow a row of alfalfa, then you grow a row of tomatoes, then you grow a row of cabbage, then you grow a row of peppers, and then you grow a row of uh, basil. So you can interplant that way, um, depending on how big your garden is. If it's just a square foot garden, then you're, you're gonna have one plant here of alfalfa, and then maybe one big sage plant in the middle and a couple tomato plants and, and do it that way. So it doesn't really matter how big or small you are, you can still have some diversity in your garden. Um, so I think this is just a beautiful plant. And I'd love to see it in the field because it really does help the soil recover from our conventional um, farm crops. So burdock who not grows burdock, <laughs> but who has burdock. <laughs> so I love this plant, and it's not in flower right now, that's just in leaf. Um, this is um, um, a horseradish here, <laughs> so that's just a burdock plant next to it. Um, and burdock is a non-native, it has a designation of a non-native invasive species. Okay. So I could give you a whole talk on invasive species and make you love them, <laughs> which is what I want to do. I want you to love them. Um, but burdock can be invasive, so if you have a little bit of land, you have to you know, be careful of it. You have to cut it back and make sure that it doesn't send seeds everywhere. The birds love the seeds, okay? Um, it has a root that can go 30 feet down if wow. it's an old enough plant. It is a biennial. Everyone know what a biennial is? Yes? Okay. Every two years. What? Every two years. Every it means that the first year it does this. I'm so, there's a cord here that I'm watching out yeah. for. First year it does this. This guy's back. The root lives. Second year it grows this, and then it takes its leaves up its flowering stem, forms seed, drops seed. So it doesn't um, live through its root. It lives through its seed. And it does take it two years. Although, on some plants, if you keep cutting them back, and not allowing them to do what they want to do, which is to flower and seed. Plants are going, I'm trying to flower and seed, and you keep cutting me off. <laughs> and um, if you, some biennials, if you keep cutting them, they will, be, they will act like perennials, okay? So if you have a biennial you love, you might try. <laughs> See if you can get it to live longer that way. I have a question. Yes. So that burdock root, just let it grow? Well, I do. As an herbalist, I do. I dig the roots and use the roots as, as herbal medicine. So I use that. But in Japan, gobo, anyone ever have gobo? Gobo is a cultivated burdock root. In Japan, they grow it in their gardens. They go, you know, the Japanese do everything like perfect, right? I mean, everything is like perfect. So their burdock roots are like this long, okay? And they're perfectly an inch and a half around <laughs> from top to bottom. Now, when you dig wild burdock root, you're not going to find that. These are cultivated burdock. But it's a really good food. It's a really good food for us. It feeds our microbiome. Everyone knows a microbiome by now, right? <laughs> so it feeds your microbiome. So think of it that way. So you can use it as a food crop. So if you see it in your yard, like with your grass, should you just... It, de it depends. I Probably if it were, if I had a yard, and if we're in the middle, I might not like that spot for it. <laughs> so I might wait till it seeds and take the seeds and put them somewhere else. It's a big plant. And if you're, if you're happy with it there, leave it there. But if you would like it somewhere else, the best idea is when they're really small, dig them and transplant them. But the best is just to save some seed and drop some seed where you would like <coughs> it to grow. It is being such a big plant and being a weed, because everyone's going to ask you why you have that weed. Everyone will ask you <laughs> why you have that weed. Um, then you might put it in a corner or along a fence or you know somewhere else where it can be its big, bold, beautiful self and not interfere with mowing, <laughs> mowing around your burdock. Um, you wouldn't kill it if you did mow over it. It would, it would, it would still live. But um, yeah, so another example is mullen. Anyone know mullen? Okay. It grows along the roadsides. It is considered a non-native invasive species. It is not invasive. It is non-native. It is a wonderful, beautiful medicinal plant. And I remember when it first came to my garden, because some plants just come, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone has that experience. It's like you'll think, gee, I'd like to have mullein. And then next year, it's like, oh, 
at home <laughs> in my garden. And um, so anyway, so um, I remember someone walking in, and this was a big, beautiful mullein plant. I wish I had a picture of it. It was like this big around. And it wasn't in bloom, but it was leaved, and the leaves of mullein are really beautiful. And um, someone walked in the garden and said, why do you have this wheat in your garden? And it, to me, it's like, what wheat? <laughs> because to me, it's a very useful, wonderful plant. And weed, as we all know, is just a plant we do not want. That's all it is, okay? And so I, I love the weeds. I work with the weeds a lot. So we know what this is, sweet basil. Who grows basil? Okay. Do you grow with your tomatoes? Yes. Yes? And why do you grow it with your tomatoes? Keeps the hornworms away. Keeps the hornworms away, absolutely. So when you have those hornworms, those big hornworms <laughs> that like can eat half a big tomato in one day, right? You have these big hornworms and you know that the little white things on their back are their eggs, right? No, the, they're not their eggs. eggs, they're the eggs of parasitic wasps. They're the wasp. eggs of the parasitic, that's what I meant. They're the eggs of the parasitic wasp so that it, they, the, the pupa of the, that hatch from the eggs eat the hornworms. So keep the one with the little parasitic wasp eggs on it. Um, the other ones, if you have chickens. <laughs> what? Chickens love Oh, they do, they do. I found one out in the wild though, that was twice as big as my thumb. It was like the biggest hornworm I had ever seen. Um, and I saw it driving, so you know how big it was. <laughs> I could actually see it. I stopped and I went over and there it was. So anyway, so it was a pretty big. Um, but basil is, as you see, improves flavor and growth of your tomatoes. And it really does. I have never had pests in my tomatoes or diseases in my tomatoes. So one year, I don't know why, I didn't grow enough basil with my tomatoes. Because like I said, I used to grow and sell organic vegetables, so I grew a lot of tomatoes, so um, I had to have a lot of basil. For some reason, I didn't, and it was the only year that I had a problem with my tomatoes. Um, so um, basil, besides being you know, a wonderful plant, we like to use it, is, is a wonderful plant in the garden. And it is an annual, so you can, inter you can intersperse it with your tomatoes, or grow them row to row, you know, if you like a lot of basil and a lot of tomatoes, yes. Does purple basil have the same benefits? Yes, okay. yeah. There are all Osamum basilicum, which is its genus and species, Osamum basilicum, and then they will then they will have like cinnamon. I love cinnamon basil. Yeah. It is just yeah. like heavenly. Ah. <laughs> um, so any of the basils you can use. Um, what I would say is that um, cinnamon, um, you need to keep your basils in leaf for them to have the most effect at repelling disease and insects. Um, lemon basil um, seems to flower and go to seed much more quickly than some of the other basils might also. Um, but you can Thai basil, African, African blue basil is a wonderful basil that grows about four feet tall and it has this beautiful maroon coloration to the leaves and the stem. Um, and it's a tender perennial basil. It won't live here over the winter but if you bring it in, you can get it easily to four years, many years. Yes, if we could turn off our phones. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> so um, any, any, any variety of basil that you want to grow um, is, is good in the garden. So calendula, anyone grow calendula? Okay, why do you grow calendula? Pretty. It, well, yes. <laughs> it is beautiful. Um, it adds diversity. Um, the bees and the beneficial, some of the beneficial bees, the small little beneficial bees in, enjoy calendula. It is a beautiful, bright, happy, you know, it makes you happy to look at it, right? Um, plant in there, and as you can see, it's rich in vitamin A and C, so it does help um, with the soil. Um, and it blooms all summer long. So, deadheading it, you can easily deadhead it. If you have annuals, just every day walk out. You just make it a habit. Walk out, deadhead, deadhead, deadhead. And pinch your basil back, because that sweet basil you were looking at, the minute the temperature gets to 80 degrees and it gets dry, it's going to want to flower. And that's what it wants to do. That's what it's supposed to do. So it's only doing what the plant is supposed to do. But we don't want it to do that. And remember, the most important thing is gardening is not benign. There's nothing benign about gardening. We are growing what we want to grow in the place we want to grow it, no matter what was growing there before. 
So it is not it is not a benign thing. We are wanting to grow Mediterranean herbs <clears throat> in the middle of Indiana. And ones like lavender or sometimes I can no, sorry. <laughs> not going to I'm not going to grow here. Um, so so they sometimes take a little more care. Calendula is happy in any so, garden soil. Yes. So it says vitamin A, vitamin C. So is that you're taking that from like the, the leaves of the plant? No, it's it? it's the flowers, the actual ray flowers. flowers. <laughs> yeah, that's the part you're using. Okay. And they're very resinous. If you touch a calendula plant, it's they're sticky with resin, and, and that's part it, of their like their a, medicine. Also, use it like a tea or something. Or I'm sorry. How do you use it? Yeah, yeah, tea. Tea. tea to make an oil. I make calendula oil. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is chickweed. So who has chickweed in their gardens right now? Can yes. You, you mean against my will? <laughs> <laughs> no. So so weed it. Okay. Take it out of your garden and then eat it. Oh no. Oh, oh, have you eaten it ever? No. Oh, it is so green and moist and luscious, and it just, I make, um, I make chickweed pesto. Oh, wow. Um, I also, you know, and then I just make salads and add the chickweed. Um, I also tincture it fresh, so it's a wonderful herb, nutritious. It helps give us indications of whether the area is dry or moist, okay? Um, lots of minerals. And is a ruderal. So, does anyone know what a ruderal is? A ruderal is that plant. So, whether nature does it or man does it, sometimes the ground is laid bare. You know, a storm, we have flooding, um, the ground gets destroyed, and the plants over there are no longer there, and you have bare ground. Okay, the plants that come in, what we call weeds, are the ones that are supposed to come in. Dandelion is one. They come in and they hold the soil, they send down their roots, they bring nutrients up from the subsoils, and they make, they keep the soil healthy until the plants that will grow there, and it will never be the same. Once a flood or something is washed out or man has taken all the plants out, it will never grow back exactly as it was, okay? But these plants help us to get there, to have healthy soil again to be able to grow the plants that we want to grow. And it's beautiful. <laughs> Stellaria media. <laughs> See, dandelion. <laughs> so who grows dandelion? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, dandelions are great. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves, you can eat the roots. So it's a wonderfully edible plant. The leaves get kind of bitter when it's in flower, but it's a great beneficial insect plant also. Um, so, it, it, again, like I said, it's a ruderal also. Um, and the roots, depending on how old the dandelion is, um, can help to break up soil also. So it's, it's doing its job. It is a good plant to have. And I was just having this conversation, um, and um, I have never used chemicals and will never use chemicals and, and, and hope that eventually the world will be there also is that uh, someone was talking about, we all know Japanese bush honeysuckle, right? <laughs> okay, right. And this was a person with just their own piece of, you know, just a yard, and they had one. And it was like, well, how do you get rid of it? And so, um, and we, I, I teach in herbal studies, um, uh, I teach herbal studies, and so this was our class. And I went to fix lunch, and one of the other apprentices told this other apprentice, um, to that if you can't keep it, you know, if it starts come growing back, right? You haven't dug it all out, um, or, or you just cut it back and it starts to grow again, to use Roundup. <laughs> so I walked in and just said, no. <laughs> no, we don't use Roundup. Because most of us have a small enough piece of land, and I have 27 and a half acres, and I don't use any chemicals anyway. And if you cut your... Japanese bush honeysuckle down, or dig up the roots, and it comes back. Every day, I just go out to that place, walk by that space with my pruners, and I cut it again, and I cut it again, and I cut it again. <coughs> and eventually, if you keep up with it, it will not come back. So it takes time, it takes attention, and we have to really want to do this. Um, but it is possible to do. It is possible to do. I weed my dandelions out of my garden, 
and then I tincture the fresh root. I make oil out of the flowers and I eat the green leaves and I also dry the leaves. So I, I dig it up and then I use it. And what you can also do, and you have a handout about this, is the weeds that we've been talking about, any of them that you're going to dig up um, out of your garden, um, it doesn't matter what they are, just so long as they have no seed with them, so you don't want any seeds, is you're going to throw them in a bucket, you're going to fill it with water, so it's about loosely half to two-thirds full of weeds, fill it full of water, okay, let it sit for about two or three days, and then use that, because we're making tea, we're making sun tea. And it's extracting all the nutrients it took out of your garden soil is being extracted back into that water. And then you can just feed your plants with that weed tea, okay? You know, you can, uh, we visited a winery in South Dakota that makes game wine. Yes, yes, you can, <laughs> yeah. I could tell you a lot of things to do with it, but I, yeah, yeah. I usually teach for three hours, so we've got to go. <laughs> okay, so this was the picture I was talking about. That's a very sad echinacea flower. And I apologize for that sad specimen. And I don't know why I have that picture. <laughs> but I do. Now, this is a nice picture of a, of a mature clump of uh, echinacea. What we grow here is echinacea purpurea. So Echinacea purpurea is our purple cone flower, is the one that will grow in our soils here in the Midwest. Echinacea angustifolia, which is the most medicinally active, the one that we used to get if we were taking Echinacea tincture or making Echinacea tea. Angustifolia is a prairie Echinacea. There are nine species native to the United States. They all, Tennesseeensis is another species. There's one just for Oklahoma. So they're species, but purpurea is a cultivated species. It is the one to grow here if you want to go purple, purple cone flower. It is the most florific of them all. It has the most flowers, blooms the longest, so it's beautiful. The seeds, the birds love the seeds. Um, so it's a really wonderful plant. It's a perennial. It self sows itself. So you have your perennial echinacea plants and you have new little plants that come up every year that you can move around or do with what you would like. So it's a really um, wonderful plant and it grows in communities. It likes to be in communities. A lot of, most plants do, uh, all plants do. <laughs> all plants like to grow in communities. So who grows echinacea? And what people love about it is it's beautiful almost all the time in the garden. Uh, Hisopus officinalis, anyone grow hyssop? Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, Hisopus officinalis and um, adds diversity once again, it attracts cabbage moth butterfly. That is why I first started growing it, because I was growing a lot of cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. And the hardest thing for an organic grower is the cabbage moth. Um, Butterfly and the fact that you cut that beautiful head of broccoli and then you look in between all the little florets and you see all the little leavings of the caterpillars and the caterpillars. And what I always tell people is you go inside, take that head of broccoli or cauliflower, you rinse it off really well, you cook it, and you don't tell your children that there were caterpillars <laughs> in their broccoli, and you don't let them see the water it was cooking in, because sometimes you didn't get them all, but you don't let them know, and you take them out, and you serve it anyway. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'd rather have never have had broccoli or cauliflower. You know, and I could, I threw <laughs> lots of broccoli away one year. I was ready for the freezer, and I cleaned it and soaked it in salt water and cooked it, and all they came to the top, and it was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't eat it after Not that? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, and the, the thing is, the earlier you can get those crops out, the better, because they really like the cooler weather. They do better. You get them to harvest time before there's a, a lot of the cabbage moth butterfly. But isn't it beautiful? Mm -hmm. It really is a beautiful plant. Um, yeah. And it has a lot of other uses. We can talk about another time. Uh, Lavendula officinalis um, and angustifolia could be another. It's interesting because Lavendula angustifolia, which means narrow leaved, what I love about the botanical names is also they tell us about the plant. Uh, something about the plant, um, and this uh, Lavendula um, 
Angustifolia means narrow leaved, and lavender has narrow leaves. Officinalis is what we call it as a as a vault of, excuse me, as an essential oil, and as a plant we call it Lavendula um, angustifolia. The English lavender is a great bee plant. It's a good one to interplant. All these plants I'm talking about, um, um, which will come up more, the lavender and the basil, it's great to interplant. And what I would tell you is, oh, I have plants. <laughs> I have plants up here. Um, okay, so we haven't, I don't think we've talked about any of the ones I have up here, except um, lavender. I thought I brought a lavender, but maybe I didn't. Um, I guess I didn't. Um, lavender is later in coming up and, and growing well in a greenhouse because it really loves the warmth. And lavender is a plant that doesn't necessarily, isn't happy where you plant it. I tell you, if you keep trying, sometimes you can find that spot in your yard or in your garden where it will finally be happy. Um, it loves the sun, likes warm sun, warm air, likes well-drained soil, um, does not like clay soil. Um, you can get it established in clay, it, it does okay until it gets really, really dry, really dry in August. When we have a hot, dry August, then it's not gonna be as beautiful. I, one thing I <clears throat> also need to say is I never water my garden. The only thing I water is basil, because as we all know what I spoke about earlier, it's going to flower and seed, and then we know that basil gets to a certain point of flowering and seeding where there's no recovery. It's like, you know, that's it. Like I cut them back by half and then I'll feed them and I'll get some more, but it will never be that beautiful, lush, first growth that you get the first you know couple months of growing it. Um, so, um, yeah. Should you trim back lavender? In the spring, but not in the fall. I never do in the fall. Because of Indiana winters, snow keeps our soil at 32 degrees, or excuse me, 37 degrees. And so it protects our root, up roots of our plants. This is a Mediterranean plant. It's used to more sun. We have a lot of clouds in the winter time. And we have clay soil that is either too wet or too dry through the winter time, okay? And so therefore, lavender can struggle. Always mulch it, even though it, it, you know, we know it as a plant that likes hot and dry, I always mulch my lavenders and they survive much better with the, when it's being mulched. And I never prune them in the, I prune them back in the, in the fall, um, always in the spring. Because whatever we have growing above on a perennial plant is, has some kind of um, protection. It's some kind of protection, no matter how little, maybe only a degree or two, but that may be just what it needs to survive the winter. Lemon balm. See, I heard that, oh God. Did you hear that, oh God? This is a wonderful plant. <laughs> and if you ever have any you are just pulling out, dig them up and bring them to me. I will take them all. <laughs> It is an important medicinal herb. It is a great bee plant. It is a wonderful plant. And yes, it does seed. Okay? How I tell you not, so it's not seeding everywhere, is just cut it back before it flowers. Cut it back by half. And then it will regrow and it won't flower and seed. <laughs> See, we all have opinions about plants. <laughs> And uh, the honeybees, obviously, they used to rub the inside of hives with lemon balm to attract the bees to new hives. Yeah. So find find your local beekeeper and say, I've got some lemon balm for you. <laughs> Chamomile. Okay, this is a really wonderful um, plant. Um, Matricaria recutita. Um, we're going through this the other, yesterday, I was going through this with my granddaughter who's nine, and she was um, um, saying all the botanical names. She did a pretty good job. I was surprised at how well she did. <laughs> um, but this is a wonderful self-seeding annual. The thing about the herbs and growing them is that many times the packages of the seeds don't give us enough information about how to really germinate the plants well or get a higher amount of germination, right? Um, chamomile is one of those. Uh, very few packages say it's a light determinant gen, um, de, um, germinator, a light determinant germinator, which means that it has to have light to germinate, okay? And so if you're making a row and you're sprinkling your seed and covering it all up, you will not get your chamomile. Eventually, some of them may make it, you know, up to the top of the soil through watering and rain and things like that, and you may get some, but you won't have very good germination rates. 
So it's really you just put it on top of the soil, lightly tamp it, because if you tamp it too hard, all that dirt you're tamping is falling on top of the seed. Um, <clears throat> it destroys damping off disease. <clears throat> Anyone ever have damping off? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you don't grow the plants yourself, the likelihood is that they use some chemical to keep the damping off from your plants. And um, so you have plants that have that chemical on them instead of plants with damping off. But German chamomile, you make a tea, you let it cool down, you dilute it by half with water, and you spray it on your plant, and you will see an immediate response. It is, I remember the first time I did it, it was like, here was this plant, you know, damping off, what happens is, <clears throat> this is Angelica, by the way, um, is that the stem gets thin and black and weak, okay? And the plant just starts to wilt. And you think, but I've watered. It shouldn't be wilting, right? That's the first sign, is that it looks like it's wilting when it shouldn't be wilting. It grows in the soil of the plant, so you have to, you might wanna put clean soil, you might, might want to just, you know, use a, um, your fingers or a fork or something and loosen the soil. And um, so then you take your chamomile tea, you spray the soil, you spray the whole plant under and the top, all over, and you will see the plant, it's almost like it goes, ah, thank you. Because literally within hours, you can see a difference in the plant. That what, was the, what was the recipe for that again? Make a cup of chamomile tea, which is one rounded teaspoon per eight ounces of water. You put the cup, you know, you put a saucer on it, you cover it to steep it. You steep it for about 10 minutes, and then you strain the chamomile out, and then you dilute it by half and put it in a spray, sprayer bottle. Also, add a few drops of dish soap. Dish, dish soap breaks the tension so that the water adheres to the leaves and doesn't just roll off, so it adheres to the leaves. So add a few drops of dish soap to whatever your, you know, fertilizer, seed, you know, whatever you're spraying onto your plants, um, as long as it's not chemical. <laughs> um, yeah, but this is a wonderful plant. This is a very labor-intensive plant, so if you drink a lot of chamomile tea, <laughs> you are in for a lot of work, because all we are using is that. It'll be a three foot tall plant, about this big around, and all you are harvesting are each little little flower that probably He's about as big as my fingernail. So they have tools. Johnny Selected Seed has a chamomile harvesting tool. It's a rake that you go like this and pop off the block. Um, so you can you can get that. Oh. Something happened. <laughs> So anyway, chamomile is a wonderful, it's fragrant, it's beautiful, beneficial in sexual health chamomile also. So, it's a great plant to have. This is, um, what? Cat mint. Yes, cat mint. <laughs> Nepita musini and Nepita cataria, that's catnip. So we have both of them. I still keep forgetting I have it in front of me. Um, catnip is a wonderful plant to grow. It's beautiful, you can see how beautiful it is in flower. If your cats are, it's hereditary whether cats will like it or not. So what you do is you get a plant and set it out, and if they destroy it, then maybe you shouldn't have a cat. Um, usually you can get it to live for a year, then the cats don't like it as much. In plant form, they aren't as attracted to it. Still, if you dry it and put it in a little bag or throw it on the floor, they'll still enjoy it. It's a wonderful medicinal herb. Um, it repels feed beetles. So this is why I first started growing it. I had potato growing, and it was a warm, early warm, and that's usually when you get flea beetles, is when it gets warm and dry earlier in the season. And so I just, what I did was just cut my catnip, and I laid it all along my potatoes plant, and because it repels the flea beetles. Um, and the finches come and sit on the flowers when it's in seed, when the, when the flower, when it's formed seed, they will sit in your garden and uh, flit around your cat, cat milk. Cat mint, I just grow because I love it. <laughs> it smells minty and cinnamony and, you know, bees like it and beneficial insects like it. And your cat absolutely loves catnip, meaning that it will climb a wall to get to catnip um, or tear out a plant to get to catnip. Um, then it will probably kind of like catnip, because they're the same genus, just different species. But they don't smell 
alike. There is, if you, if, okay, how you smell something is that you take a leaf and you rub it really hard in your hands and then you go <coughs> really deeply and then you sit with it and see what you smell. <laughs> This is Evening Primrose, so um, nourishing for plants and people. It has a yellow blossom. I remember being um, told, <laughs> shown this plant by a woman when I first moved to Indiana. She lived across the road on a farm, and she came over and got my son and I, and she says, here, I want to show you. Come, it was the evening. I want to show you this plant. And in the evening, the flower opens. And so she, we sat in her back on her back patio and watch the evening primrose blossom open. Um, but it, once again, adds diversity. The seeds are good food for, um, for animals and, in, and birds, so it's a nice plant. This isn't showing it in flower. This is, I guess, it's an inter, it's a still, it's, it, help, it will help you identify it by seeing it like this, um, by seeing it like this, because it is at this stage, it could be, to many people, they would look at it and think, oh, that's a weed, mm -hmm. you know? And we do that a lot. In fact, I have, I brought a couple weeds. <laughs> <laughs> because I love weeds. <laughs> so, you weed if you don't want. anyone you recognize this one? And the dark, dark Yeah, pass it around. And take some and eat it if you want. It's really good. Oh, yeah, I don't know what this is. It's wood sorrel. The name's on the tag. I have the tag on it. I always called it sauerkraut because the seeds taste really sour. So does the leaves. The whole plant does. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really good plant to eat. It has a sour taste. Um, it's a low growing, fairly low growing. This is stricta. This species is stricta, oxalis stricta, so it can get, you know, 10, 12 feet, 12 inches, excuse me, tall. Um, and it just, so eat it. If you're going to pull it out, eat it before you, after you pull it out. It's great in salads. You can make tea out of it, a nice sour tea. I love sour things, so that's maybe why I love it. I grew up outside San Francisco and New York in major metropolitan areas when I was growing up, and, and we still ate this. I still knew this when I moved to Indiana and moved out into the country. I still knew this plant, so you'll all recognize it. It has little yellow clover-like flower, flowers and clover-like um, leaves. And this one, if, if you're seeing fields that are full of purple, yeah, purple dead nettle. Purple dead nettle, <laughs> which is this. This doesn't look quite like it does out in the field because this plant was in my greenhouse. It's with the self heal plant, so there are two in one here. Um, and it is a Lamiaceae family plant, or a basil mint family plant. Lamiaceae used to be Labiatae, but is now Lamiaceae. And in most herbals or most books, you will see both, both uh, plant names both family names, um, because the others we've had for 100 years or more, and then they changed them, so it's, it's helpful to have both of them there. Um, so Lamiaceae, meaning that Lamium, anyone grow Lamiums? Okay, Lamiums, that is the largest genus in the family, so that's why it's called Lamiaceae. It, and before Labiatae, because tulips, the flowers are tulips, so that's why it was called Labiatae. So there's, there's a reason for everything. <laughs> but anyway, so you will see, people think that this has been planted in fields because there's so much of it. And what, what um, agriculturalists, because not everyone is a farmer anymore, there are farmers and there are agriculturalists. There are people who use the land to grow things, and then there are people who love the land and grow things. <laughs> so, um, and um, so chickweed and this, um, purple dead nettle, and it's, you, if I pass it around, you can see the little flower and see how it's two-lipped also, because it is a Lamiaceae family plant. They hold the soil and they keep it cold and damp. So in the spring, we want the soil to warm up and we want it to loosen up and we want it to, and we want it to dry out some. We don't want it to be really wet. And these two plants, because they grow in mass, um, keep the soil cold and wet. And so that's, so if it's in your garden, chickweed or this, you know, it, that area of the garden is going to be colder and moister. Um, take longer to dry and to, to warm up. Who has stinging nettle? <laughs> Come 
I'm a Rezo fan. Everyone needs to eat that. Everybody. This is the most nutritious plant on the planet. The most nutritious plant on the planet. So if everyone was drinking nettle long infusion, which is a tea, just keep longer, um, every day we would all be much healthier and happier. <laughs> it, it, it does sting. Um, when I'm harvesting my, because I probably have a bed that's that wall to that wall, and um, it came into my compost pile. <laughs> of course, because rich, lovely soil, so nettle goes, oh, just where I want to be. And it started to grow, and each year I'd walk by my compost pile and say, I need to move that nettle. I need to move the nettle. And because it, it kept taking over and taking over. And then about the fifth year, I said, ah, I'll just make my compost pile somewhere else. Because the nettle, <laughs> I'm not going to move all this nettle. <laughs> so I have lots of nettle, and it's wonderful, wonderful. And it's another herb along with comfrey. That is comfrey nut. <clears throat> no, but plantain you can use. Um, but how do I go back? Um, but this is another plant, if you have stinging nettle, that you can put in your bucket also and make fertilizer. Because it, like I said, the most, it has the most vitamins and minerals and the most nourishing plant there is. But it does sting. And urticadoica, urticaria, hives. So externally it creates hives and internally it has an antihistaminic effect. So plantain, everyone has plantain, right? They actually think that there might be a species that is native to um, the United States because plantain is not native. And you're, are we way over time? I have no idea. <laughs> We have about 10 minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So plantain attracts beneficial insects. The seed heads, you know, the seed heads. Don't you hate when you mow the lawn and then within hours, those seed heads are right there. And it's like, but I just mowed. And there they are. Um, so that's the only thing I dislike about plantain. Everything else I love. But the seeds, you can use like psyllium. You've heard of psyllium, right? As a bulk laxative. You can use your plantain seeds in the same way. So it attracts beneficial insects, it's nourishing, and it, it um, naturalizes easily. Um, they called it, native peoples called it white man's foot. Because wherever white man went, plantain was left behind. <laughs> also, plantain likes compressed soil. And so white man's foot, we compressed, you know, we were compressing the soil, making more compressed soil, and so plantain was like, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> So Petrocellium crispum, parsley. So this is the flower here. There's a swallowtail, um, caterpillar. Um, you touch them and they're little. <laughs> um, uh, but they will eat a lot of parsley. <laughs> so I always grow parsley for them and parsley for me. <laughs> because they can eat, they, they're pretty voracious eaters. You want them there because they're the butterflies, they're beneficial, but you don't want oh your parsley eaten either. Did I forget anything? Mineral rich. Yes. A lot of the herbs, all herbs, all plants have minerals, okay? But herbs seem to have higher amounts of minerals. And minerals like calcium, having trouble going to sleep instead of drinking a glass of milk, you have a, a cup of nettle tea. So it will give you that calcium that relaxes our nervous system so that we can sleep and rest. <coughs> red clover. So red clover, we see lots of fields of red clover. Red clover is great for beneficials and bees. Um, in my garden, I have a main path through my garden. And I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just grow white Dutch clover. You know, it only gets about four. You don't have to mow it. It blooms. It attracts the bees. <clears throat> so I had this path through my garden about four feet wide and I don't know, 50 or however long it was, is, and um, it was full of, of white Dutch clover and the honey, it was full of honeybees. No one would go in the garden <laughs> because of all the honeybees. They would, it, 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 it was kind of like, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of having people come and walk through the garden. <laughs> so eventually the grass came, you know, I just left it alone, kept mowing it. And yes, you have a story about white clover? Yeah, red clover. Oh, red clover. I showed yeah. my yard, and it's all red clover, and my neighbors called the weed police on me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Because she hated that I killed my ugly lawn, and now 
I have deer that come and lay in my red clover at night all summer long. Yeah. And the bees were pollinating all my gardens. Right. And everyone was like, she's growing weeds. And it's like the weed police man yeah. said, red clover is a noxious weed. And they said, no, it's actually an herb, you idiot. And I said, <laughs> do you want to come and actually look at it? Because I said, I don't think you've ever been to my house. Because from the street where you said you stood, you couldn't tell what you were looking at because it hadn't bloomed yet. Right. And it's on, it's, I'm reseeding because it's biennial, so yes. it dries off. So it's, Well, it's it's not that it's biennial. I won't cut it. Every two years yeah. you have to reseed it because yeah. it doesn't reseed itself right. well enough to have a good cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I am feeding all the deer that come all over my neighborhood. <laughs> and the bees are so happy because Nice. My whole front yard is yeah. full of clover. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good thing. It gets a lot taller. And we don't mow anymore. Yes. It gets, it gets a lot taller, and that is some people's objection to using other plants instead of grass is because you can't mow them and they'll look like grass looks yeah. like when it's mowed. It's and it's taller, and some people, you know, just don't want to walk through six taller things. <laughs> We, it's interesting because the reason we love grass, there is a reason humans love grass. So we walked out of Africa, however long ago we walked out of Africa, right? So grasslands, right? We lived in grasslands. And grasses grew really, really tall. A lot of grasses can grow really, really tall. The ones we have far along are bred to be short and to be mown. Um, and so what we did with grasses is we either let them grow up so that we were sheltered and shielded and hidden from animals or other people or whomever it was. So we used it that way, or or we used it or we used it as food. So it, it it or we cut it down, and if we cut it down, it was so we could see what was coming at us. So it just depended on what situation we were in. So we have a long history of loving grasses, using grasses appreciating grasses and so because I I wanted to I couldn't figure out why we love grass <laughs> why do we love grass why do we want a lawn and that is like it's written on our DNA okay because some things are still written on our DNA from that long ago and have not changed and I think grass is one of those so you can give yourself a break if you like grass <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this is symphytum. These are different comfries. Symphytum caucasicum, symphytum officinale. Um, this um, is <clears throat> a beautiful one that some say is native in places in Indiana. Um, just like it's, it's not definitive, just like the native plantain is not definitive. Um, I guess the experts haven't made the decision yet. I'm not really sure. But anyway, so this is about um, this tall, the Caucasicum in flower. It's, it's only like four inches tall in leaf. Um, and it says about 12 inches or so of flowering stem. The bumblebees adore your comfries. The bees adore your comfries. Comfrey is the best plant to, when you're cutting back the flowering stems, pulling off the you know leaves that don't look as beautiful. Because I do that all the time, even though I love my plants and I love the fact that it's diverse and lots of different insects, and I still want my garden to be beautiful. You know, so if leaves aren't looking as beautiful, I pull them off, so I throw them in a bucket with comfrey and throw them in a bucket and then add water and I have great fertilizer for my plants, uh, my potted plants. Um, so yeah, so um, that's just another picture of a, a stand of comfrey and obviously because of that. <laughs> so butterflies like comfrey. It is one of those herbs, especially if you're reading about it as an herb, that you will hear opposing thoughts on whether it is toxic and never should be <laughs> touched or grown or used, and where it is a wonderful plant. I'm on the wonderful plant end of that conversation um, because we learn we learn things all the time as a people, um, and. We think we know something, and so we are determined. We we know that, and we hold that knowledge. And it takes us a long time to overcome to let go of that knowledge of something that we knew for so long. And this is comfrey is one of those plants. 
that we now know it is not uh, toxic to human beings. Um, but we have a hard time letting go of the fact that of what has been said before now, what has been known. And it's the pyrolyzidine alkaloids, PAs are pyrolyzidine alkaloids. And um, there are 600 in the plant kingdom. And many of them are totally non-toxic. And some are very, very toxic. So what we thought, because we had general knowledge about pyrolyzidine alkaloids, we thought all pyrolyzidine alkaloids were toxic. So if a plant contained them, we shouldn't eat them, shouldn't use them. Um, but what we found is the ones in Comfrey, there are three. There's one that's slightly toxic, and that's in the root, so we never eat the root internally, take the root in, use it as medicine, and the other two are non-toxic, and they are in the leaves. So, rosemary. So rosemary, I'm gonna pass rosemary around. <laughs> and you just love, love rosemary as I pass it around. <laughs> um, rosemary, rosemary, and it's a fish in Alice. Um, insect and disease repellent. Um, most of the herbs are talking about the ones that have aromatic principles. When we smell, what that smell, rosemary or sage or thyme, that's an aromatic principle that we're smelling. And these, that's what repels insects. And, um, and companion plants, once again, tomatoes and green beans, it's a good one to interplant. This is French thyme. French thyme is a short-lived perennial meaning that it'll live for two or three years, but you need to replace it before the third year, um, sometimes even the second year. So you need to watch your plant, see how healthy it looks on its second year, and then start new plants or get a new plant to replace it. It's a little shrub, a 12-inch shrub. It is the best for culinary use um, and, and for as medicine. They still use thymol in medications, which comes from other plants, but it was named from for thyme. Um, but yes, I am sorry to start talking about time. <laughs> I left rosemary behind. Rosemary, this efficient hours. Rosemary, it does increase oxygen in our circulatory system, stimulates the circulatory system, takes more oxygen to our brain, increases our ability to remember things. It does. Especially if you have a rosemary while you're studying or reading something and you smell it while you're doing that and then you have it when you're taking a test or when you're trying to remember, then it helps you. It's just the smell will help you remember. Um, drinking the tea is even better. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Oh, I guess I didn't have time. I'm gonna pass time around. Oh, or did I pass it? Did I pass it? No, not yet. Okay, see, there's that memory thing. <laughs> um, so this is the apothecary rose. This rose has been in cultivation and all our fruit, I mean, most of our fruit trees are rose family plants. I mean, we have a lot of rose family plants. Um, the apothecary rose has been in cultivation since the 1540s. Um, I love it because it's beautiful. It's not really big. It's like four to five feet tall. Has these beautiful um, semi-double, two-inch, uh, medium pink flowers that <coughs> smell absolutely wonderful. Um, so I make rose water and I dry the rose petals and then I get rose hips. Uh, rose hips, one of the high sources of vitamin C for us. So um, it's a wonderful plant to have. It does send out runners. So uh, I started out with five plants. Um, so one, two, three, four, five plants. And now I have a bed that's that big. <laughs> and I keep it there. So many of the plants that I grow in my garden, um, which I think I do have. So oh, that's another uh, 1860 bourbon rose, which is a small one inch pale. They're wonderful um, plants in the garden. They're beautiful. Sage, when we get to the Artemisias, I'll talk more about um, keeping invasive, quote unquote, invasive plants in line in your garden. So Salvia officinal, Alice, I don't know why it's there twice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wrote it the first time there, then I liked it better there, and I forgot to take the first time there. I have no idea, <laughs> but anyway. Redundancy, right? <laughs> so this is your garden sage. And there are others, there are others, there's burr garden, if anyone grows burr garden, which is a German cultivar. Has rounder leaves, it doesn't flower, has beautiful shape in the garden. These are shrubs, these are shrubby plants. These are short-lived shrubby plants. So four or five years, they get old and woody. You can keep them going. I have a 
87 to 23, so 24, so whatever number of years that is, <laughs> I have a sage plant that's that old. Um, it no longer is one sage plant. Though. You know how plants naturally layer, right? They send out their branches and they root. We can do this on purpose with our sage when it starts getting older, like about the third year, you can take branches and root them right there in the garden uh, by loosening the soil. You strip the leaves off your sage um, and then you bury with a couple, two or three inches of soil, bury that bare part of the stem, set a little stone on it or something to hold it in place so it doesn't loosen and come out. And then uh, if you do that in June, by the fall, you can cut that plant from its mother plant and have a new sage plant. If you do it in the fall, by the next spring, you will have a new sage plant. So it's a way of propagating, easily propagating your own plants. And sage is a good one to do that with since it is a short-lived perennial. Um, but like I said, if you go out, like you'll have your sage plant here, and it starts getting old and woody, so every year, when in the spring I go out and I pull out all the old dead woody places, okay? And then I mound the soil into the places that are still growing and looking beautiful. Um, and so instead of having one, I will then have, have, my first sage plant was like one, like three to four foot sage plant, and eventually it was like eight smaller sage plants. And those lived another years, and then, so I still have some of the original plants, but it's not the original plant, okay? because they've layered themselves in the garden. But, um, so sage repels diseases throughout the garden, um, attracts beneficial when it's in flower. It flowers in May here in Indiana. Um, we all don't know what this spring will bring, whether things will bloom earlier or, or later. Um, and hope it's a better growing year than last year, right? <laughs> Last year, things didn't thrive in the same way they have usually thrived. Let me quickly go through the other. So these are all the different times. Um, Thymus surphylum, which is creeping mother of time. It's a really beautiful one, as you can see from the color of the flowers. But they're a wonderful, beautiful plant. The bees and the beneficial uh, flies and wasps and bees love all the time um, when they're in flowers. So they're wonderful plants to grow. And they like to growing colonies too, <laughs> communities. So the Artemisias are wonderful plants. Um, so we have, um, here we have, what do we have? Um, we have um, Abrotanum, um, Southernwood. Um, Southernwood, then we have Tarragon, then we have White Sage, we have Mugwort, and we have Sweet Annie. Um, so we have all these, these are just some of the Artemisias. Artemisias are good beneficial insect plants, they are good plants to add diversity, and they are beautiful ornamental plants that have many uses um, in the garden um, and in the home and in um, and as um, medicine. Anyone grow artemisias? Yeah. That's it. Oh, by the way, I have to say this. <laughs> it goes to my on-running theme of invasive plants. <laughs> is mugwort. <clears throat> mugwort about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, maybe even longer than that ago, became a non-native invasive species in, in, in Indiana. We have a group of people that get together, and I think part of it is Indiana Native Plant and Wildlife Society. Um, I think they're a part of this, and they decide what plants are non-native, well, we know whether they're native or not, okay, but whether they're invasive or not. <clears throat> Where I, where I live now, we moved in 1987, and coming along the railroad tracks south of where we live, there was a stand of mugwort. And uh, so and it, so I, I noticed it, okay, and then I grow mugwort. It's a different species of mugwort, but it's still mugwort. And um, I grow the mugwort, um, Artemisia vulgaris, in my garden. And um, this mugwort has been in the exact same spot since 1987. Mm -hmm. Because remember I was talking about diseases and, and insects and plants keeping invasive, what we call invasives, contained, that's exactly what, there are all different plants growing around it. And it hasn't seed, it'll seed in my garden. It'll seed in my garden. And I just dig them up, pop them and sell them to you, or which I, <laughs> which I can no longer do because it's a non-native invasive species. Um, so. I no longer do that. <laughs> but if you want. <laughs>
Um, but anyway, and it will seed. So it, it's not that it doesn't seed, but we have native plants that seed. If you give them the space, my wild ginger is growing wild. I mean, it's literally going to every empty space in this little woodland I have in my main garden. And I love that. And if I don't want it there, I dig it up and move it somewhere else. It, but it's not crowding anything out, okay? <coughs> and my mugwort, I keep where it is in the garden, okay? Um, it seeds, has little plants, and I keep it, you know, I'll take my shovel and cut, you know, the root, you know, around where I want it to stay um, so that it's not <coughs> spreading by root. So my point is, is that that mugwort is in the exact same place it was since 1987. In my mind, that's not an invasive <coughs> Because if it were invasive, I'd be seeing it growing all along the roadsides, both sides of the roads. I'd see it in the bare spots in the neighbors, you know, their areas. I, you know, people would be complaining about it. You know, that damn mugwort? <laughs> Came from over there. <laughs> I think I've been accused of things like that. <laughs> but anyway, so obviously, it has been considered a non-native invasive species. I can continue to grow it. I can continue to make medicine out of it. I can continue to harvest it and dry it. I just can no longer sell it. Or give it away. You can't even give it away. So if anyone has mugwort, I will not dissuade you from giving it away, but tell you that you cannot legally give it away. <laughs> uh, Killian milkwood and yarrows. I'm sure there's lots of yarrow being grown. Come on, people. <laughs> yeah. Yarrow is a great, this is our wild yarrow. This came in the 1600s as burdock did. Burdock came in the 1600s too. Wild yarrow came in the 1600s and is considered a naturalized native. Because it lives happily without, no one ever says all of these, well, people in gardens, I've heard people in gardens saying that yarrow takes over everything. And I'm always like, you need to bring it to me. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, ABACA family of plants, again, another one, um, enriches the soil specifically with calcium. The wonderful thing about this plant for gardeners is that when you have yarrow and you're out cutting things, so when I'm cutting herbs or flowers or whatever, I'm not really sure why, but I always hold this finger out when I grab the stems. And I don't know why I do, I just do. And so I went like this. Um, and I had about a quarter of an inch cut right at the crease here, okay? So I didn't want to go inside and stop harvesting, so I grabbed the yarrow leaf, I wrapped it around, it stopped the pain and bleeding immediately. Half an hour I went in, half an hour later I went in, took it off, never put anything on it. Wow. <laughs> so yarrow is a wonderful plant for gardeners who, if you get scratched by the roses or <laughs> whatever it is, or if you cut your finger like I did, um, you know, it's a wonderful plant. It's a, considered uh, um, a, and it's, it's interesting because so many of what we call weeds are plants that came, we brought, people brought here because they were medicine, because they were useful plants, and they brought them here and with them, and, um, and then we find that the native people have taken these European plants, and they, for hundreds of years, they've been using them as medicine in his healing plants. So a lot of what we think or is not necessarily what we know, it's what we've been told. And so um, besides invasive plants, my what I like to talk about is thinking deeply about things. We really need to, as a world, and especially as a country, to think really deeply about things, right? So this is the path that used to be white clover, a path into my garden. <laughs> so, um, and then, so my garden is a, like two and a half acres, okay? Um, it's got grassy areas in between beds and you know stuff like that, but two and a half acres. And this is what I wrote. Gardening, our connection to Gaia. Gardening is our connection to the earth and all who live upon it. The garden is our place of grounding, a place where we are present in the moment, a place to let go of the noise of our lives. Gardening is an act of nurturing the earth, the plants, the insects that pollinate, feast upon and feed our plants, and thus feed and nurture ourselves. Gardening is an act that keeps us physically, emotionally, and spiritually whole. We begin with the thought, <clears throat> and from that thought comes the physical manifestation of that thought, a garden. It's as simple as that. Go outside, put your hands into the dirt, and feed your body, mind, and 